Now let's start our second session. Uh, if we care to explore forward thinking, we can find people practicing it in many areas. In marketing and in sports, for example. On February the 24th this year, the eighth annual Thinking Forward Leadership and Innovation in Marketing Conference was held at the University of Arizona. At this conference, speakers discussed the topics related to practicing forward thinking in the sports industry. At the University of Arizona, the marketing department, there was an award. They call it Thinking Forward Leadership and Innovation in Marketing Award in recognition of the ability of the undergraduate students who can think forward. Now the second speaker of this uh, thinking forward topic is Mr. Philip Rautich, Doctor Fellow of the Elko Department. Good morning, and thank you, Daniel, for the introduction. Um, this morning I'll be talking to you about something that we all uh, relate to sports in one, way or, in one way or the other we all relate to sports whether as entertainment or we are part of it in one way or the other. And uh, I'll be talking about uh, sports from the aspect of forward thinking and how sports actually transformed the uh, Australian sports. Now uh, like the US, Australia is a sports loving country and that means everybody from children all the way to the older people, they adore sports. And in, in the 1970s and the 1980s, uh, that country was performing very poorly in the global sports and it was seen mainly in the, in the Olympics and also the Commonwealth Games. It got to a point that they were doing so poorly that the government, the government of Australia uh, got concerned and they started looking for a long-term solution to be able to uh, solve the problem and make it fun as it was for them. Now in 1973, a forward thinker by the name Professor Bloomfield was appointed by the Australian government to uh, look into coming, uh, coming up with a solution for this uh, problem he was appointed to uh, do research and be able to hopefully come up with something that will help the Australian sports so that they could enjoy sports again like they did. Now, why Bloomfield, as you may ask, because, you know, anybody else could have been picked. Well, Bloomfield was known for his passion in sports. He was always passionate about sports from when he was young. Uh, he, he himself was an, an established uh, former athlete. He was a national champion in swimming in his country. And also he was always into innovative ways of coming up with uh, ways to improve sports, not just in Australia, but in, in, in all other areas. And he also strongly believed in the modern ways of uh, training, sports training, uh, and how to uh, prevent injuries, which is apparently one of the, one of, one of the, most tr the main drawbacks in, uh, in sports, as we all know. More about him. Um, early in the in the, the mid 60s, uh, Plumfield earned himself a Fulbright scholarship to attend the University of Oregon, uh, where he's, uh, he got his PhD uh, in exercise science and sport medicine. And in 1968, he graduated. Uh, after his graduation, he went back to Australia to help uh, improve sports in his country, where he taught. He also coached. Uh, as well as developing sports programs in Australia. And perhaps one of the most, uh, most uh, outstanding moments in his career was when he was appointed by the University of uh, Western Australia to develop an extensive sports program. Uh, he was also instrumental in uh, putting together the, uh, the Department of uh, Sports Medicine in Western Australia. He transformed that region, the Western Australian region, in sports. And uh, he was also able to uh, help with coaching. 
And that caught the attention of the Australian government. His achievements during that period caught the attention of the Australian government. And uh, when the country was undergoing the struggles to be able to come up with a system that would work for the whole country in, in improving sports performance, uh, he happened to have been you know, at that time. And uh, using his innovative ways of trying to improve sports at all costs, he was appointed uh, to lead a team of research. He did extensive research uh, in Australia and in Europe, and uh, he came up with some recommendations. And uh, he put together a report also that was later to become a blueprint into uh, developing sports in Australia. Using his forward thinking uh, idea and capabilities, uh, he was able to come up with uh, a plan that and in his plan, he made a recommend, one of the main recommendations was for the Australian government to come up with, a, to develop a sports training institute that would oversee sports in Australia and hopefully move it forward. Now, in his plan, there were so many principles, but five of the main principles that, uh, that his plan was based on were one, to develop uh, sports from grassroots levels, because he thought if we can develop sports from grassroots grassroot levels will be able to uh, spread it all the way to the advanced levels. And uh, he also recommended to the, to the government to focus, the, the, to focus on developing more opportunities for all the Australian people, sports opportunities for all the Australian people. And perhaps, perhaps the most important uh, principle in his plan was to develop an ID system where uh, young people, young sportsmen or young athletes would be identified from a young age and uh, they would be recruited and once they've been recruited they'd be um, taken to the specialized academic uh, uh, special academies that were developed also and that was <clears throat> once these young athletes were taken to these sports academies, they would be trained in the specific areas, not just training, you know, in everything, but they would be Spain, trained on specific sport that they are talented in. At the same time, they will also be able to get their education at a very high level. Um, another, probably the most, the most other important aspect also in this recommendation was all these programs will be funded by the government. So the National Institute of, Institute of Sport was to oversee all these, uh, all these re uh, recommendations and be able to put it together and make it work for Australia. Well, as uh, beautiful and as colorful as the plan may have looked, and I'm going to bring this back to our organizations as well also, that we can come up with so many plans, we can come up with all these uh, forward thinking plans, but sometimes if we don't have the same uh, vision or if we don't have, if we don't share the same vision with the people in the leadership. Uh, by the way, uh, Bloomfield was just, a, just a, an ordinary person like most of us are in this room. You know, maybe he, was, he wasn't someone who, uh, who had anything special. So, no wonder his plan was not implemented for uh, more than 10 years, I mean more than eight years. Why? Because uh, most people didn't really see where he was going with this plan, even though he gave very concrete uh, recommendations. But the continuing persistence of uh, poor performance in Australian sport continued to bother people people of Australia, and it also continued to put that, you know, everybody else who loves sports. And it showed in the Olympic, uh, Olympic Games that followed in 1976, and also uh, the one that, uh, 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 the next Olympic Games that came after 19, 1976. And as we'll see some data here in a, in a minute. Since they didn't have an option, they decided that they were going to give it a try. And so they did, and that was after eight years. And uh, in 1981, Plum, Plumfield's plan was uh, implemented, and that was uh, when Australian Institute, Institute of Sport was established. And that Institute, uh, Australian Institute of Sport was to oversee all sports in Australia. And that was the turning point also for the Australian sports. 
So what does the Institute, uh, Australian Institute of Sport do? The, its mission basically was uh, to develop elite sports in Australia by providing facilities and funding to sports organization and po potential uh, uh, elite athletes. It started with eight programs and then it developed until the current 36 programs that it, ha it now has. It's headquartered in Canberra in Australia, but it also has several other uh, branches within Australia and it has recently also gone overseas since I think they have three now, three uh, training centers in Europe. And uh, we'll see a, a short uh, clip here that will show us one example of those centers, how it looks like. Uh, since the implementation of Bloomfield Plan, Australia has seen tremendous improvement in, uh, in sports and especially in the Olympic Games. And we'll see some data that will show us because sometimes we may not really understand until we see the picture. Uh, I have some data from 1976 all the way to 2012, but the improvement showed from 1984 when the plan was implemented up to today. Uh, it's also worth mentioning here that it wasn't just Australia that benefited from this plan. Other countries saw what Australia was doing and they actually started implementing the same plan and one of those beneficiaries was China, which in 1987 uh, they put in place the same plan also and they started seeing all these tremendous improvement in the Olympic Games. Um, there are so many other countries also that have, have done the same. But um, I want to take you briefly to the data because data doesn't lie. And uh, as we can see from, from this uh, data here, I have, we have five different countries just to compare. But I want, to f I want you to focus your attention on Australia and China. One, because they are the two countries that actually implemented the plan ahead of everybody else. And then uh, we'll also see how these other countries compare uh, in the next slide. And I only took 1976 to 2012 to show us where they came from and where they are now before the implementation of the plan to where they are after implementing this forward thinking idea that Bloomfield came, came up with. Okay, I want us to notice one thing here that uh, whereas all the other countries are dropping or uh, their performance are diminishing, we can see from this second one here that Australia and China are climbing in the middle count. So that tells us one thing that even though the plan was shelved for more than eight years. It was worth uh, investing in, and uh, I'm sure even the, the government of, of Australia now know that uh, they, made, um, uh, they made the right move to, impl to implement this plan. I also want us to, uh, okay, some, at this point here, where they start to, uh, to kind of flatten or stagnate a little, is when all the other countries were also implementing the same plan. So because the metal count, you have so, so many metals to compete for in Olympics, so it gets to a point where everybody else is, is as good. And that's why you see the stagnation a little. Uh, as a final note, I want us to remember one thing, that Bloomfield was not special in any way, just like most of us are here in this room today. Uh, he was in a leader. Uh, even though you, you, know, you can be a leader and be able to implement. Actually, if you are a leader, the better for you because you won't let an innovative idea sit in the shelf for more than eight years. You'll be able to implement it right away. Unfortunately for Bloomfield, he didn't have the support right away. So his idea sat for more than eight years in the shelf before it was implemented. But when it, when it, did, when it got implemented, it, uh, everyone saw the results. Uh, he set out to try and fix sports in Australia, but this plan has become transformational throughout the world. Thank you.